Ready? Yeah, I am ready. Let's do a three, three two, two, one, one. Sink. Sink. Wow, is it always like that on your end? Um, there is a delay between us, and so you always sound about a second behind me or so when uh, when you think it sounds perfect. And okay, now when, I understand wh- what you mean. Whenever I try to usually... sync up with you, you always are like, oh, he's lagging behind. Well, well, well no, it's like w- when I do the sync with you, I say it exactly when I hear you say it. So I right, but you usually lead it, and I wondered what you meant about the delay. And now that I led it, yeah, it's different. It was yeah, you you were like a second behind me on yeah. my end. So. There's about a second of lag, and uh, I when I put the things together, I do account for that. So it works out. I make sure that we don't talk over each other or interrupt each other when we shouldn't. Do. I, I mean, it seems to have worked. I think that explains why some of our older videos have like this weird thing going on where it's almost like I'm predicting what you're going to say. Yes, that's exactly what because, I've noticed before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I'm I usually uh lined them up perfectly evenly. Right. And if you do that, what happens is that it seems like you have a little bit of precognition. Yeah. <laughs> do we want to try it again with me leading or do you want to uh No, no, I think I think we got it. All right. I'm, then we're I'm pretty we're in sure good we got shape, it. I think. Uh so I I tried not to slow down in the confusion of what I was hearing. It, it is a little confusing, especially when we're not sure who's leading it. Like, when you started leading it, I'm like, okay, I'll just count. And that's that's what you have to do. You just have to count. You just got to go for it. Pretty much. You got, you got to dive in like a vampire taking to the streets of London, which, I mean, okay, first off, why London? Well, because... And now you can open the episode. Okay, well. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Warty Pair Podcast. Today, we are... Not talking about what episode number it is, but I am Rudy. And I am Justin. And today we are going to be talking about Bram Stoker's Dracula. Or is it Bram Stoker? I don't think it matters. It doesn't matter. He's long dead. He can't be offended. But But I don't think it's spelled with an H. I think it's just Bram. It is just Bram. B-R-A-M. But anyway. I mean, mean, you know. I I, I don't know. I don't know the intricacies of. A's can be pronounced in a variety of ways. What is that, an Irish book? Was he an Irish guy? I don't know. I didn't do any research about the author. I just read the book. Well, that's how you do it. I, like, there's, I mean, there's very few authors that I actually care about who the author is. <laughs> that's and... how you do it for a writing podcast. <laughs> yeah. Because we don't want to get into a biographical sketch of Dracula. Of, uh, of Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> no, the biographical sketch of, Dra- of Dracula is absolutely hilarious. But, Pretty um, much. So so this so we're not going to do a review here so much no, as no, talk about the book we're just and talk, talk about, about the book, thoughts on the book thoughts on the book and thoughts p- particularly with respect to like writing and what you know we're not going to necessarily spoil everything but like even if we do spoil uh, you're a few not. things oh I'm not <laughs> you're not going to spoil everything you're, I am gonna, I'm on the spoil train you're because on the spoil train. I am 42 years old. This book has been around forever, and I never read it. And f- my entire life, I have gone through uh, gone through thinking that all these interpretations of Dracula that I've seen in other media, probably l- mostly in things like Castlevania and maybe like some of the vampire anime, th- th- these... Some of these versions of Dracula that I have seen, yeah. I largely considered that, oh, they're probably pretty consistent with whatever the book Dracula was. Yeah. And it's just like, no. No, not at all. Not really, no. <laughs> this book impressed me out of the gate, and I can fully understand why it was such a great book. But I have a story to tell about why I never read the book. Okay, go for it. So a long time ago, I must have been like f- maybe... 14 or 13 years old i was at a friend's house and oh geez i might have been older than that i can't even remember when the dracula movie came out we're gonna do this live in this recording it was in the 90s yeah it was in the 90s okay so i was probably around that age yeah and he his he had a vhs copy of dracula and he turned the movie on and it was right at the scene where it's like all these naked vampires appear out of nowhere and I was like, well, I don't want to watch this crap. Yeah. <laughs> and so I never wa- and that that like that painted my perception image of the, of the yeah. yeah it, I was 
I was convinced that the movie was was probably trash, whereas the book might be good, but I wasn't in a hurry to read the book because I was like, oh, it's going to have a bunch of naked vampires, and I don't really care. Yeah. So fast forward to just this week, where I read this book for the first time, and boy, I wish I would have read this 20 years ago. What a great book. It's an incredible book, yeah. All written in journal format. Probably the best journal format book I've ever read. And there's not that many, really, but I mean, it's no, it's, it's an un- it's a good an uncommon one. tactic. But this was one of the first ones to actually do it in in a significant way. Yeah, well, I mean, it was the entire book was written based off of things that people were writing in journals, well, and news reports. And... What I'll say is that they're written as if they are journals, but there's an awful lot of direct quotes in these journal entries, more so than a, yeah. a normal person would probably put in a journal. Yeah, yeah I mean, they're, they're, it's. They're, 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 the, the book reminds you that you are looking at journals, but at the same time, the way that the book is written is not especially in a journal-esque format of the entries themselves. It, 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 it pushes like a fairly, a fairly standard narrative in most cases, but what happens a lot is that the perspective is changing a lot as well. And some, some time periods are getting rolled over a couple of times before you see all the different facets. Yeah, and it, it probably, I mean, a lot of journal style stories are written in that way like i mean i I struggle to think of ones that aren't mountains of madness is one of the few that i can think of that is really kind of just a straight-up journalistic entry yeah but you know as far as it goes this is definitely one of the best ones i can i mean dracula is probably the best one i can think of and it's such a different story than what i would have imagined just based off of what dracula three seconds of video that you saw well, well, no, just based off of the the common, you know, perception of Dracula in media. And oh, sure. not just Dracula, but like, we talked about this right before we decided to, it was time to record this, because I was still, I just finished the audiobook as we're recording this. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there there's a few things that I'm not going to remember, because I listened to some of the audiobook while I was laying down, and so I fell asleep for parts of it, but I figured... I'm not going to go back because I want a reason to go and read the book at some point in the near future because it was a really, really good listen. Yes. And also listening to audiobooks isn't reading. We've been over that before, too. Yes. <laughs> but, well, so this is my second time reading it. Um, it's So So the, the one thing that we should probably um, note beforehand is that this is one of those books that's old enough that it's in the public domain. Um, uh, yeah. It was published in, I think, 1897. And so it is like way, way out of of um, out of out of uh, copyright, and that means that you can get copies of it for free, basically on the internet. You can find find them at archive.org. You can find them at various websites that you know also have commentary and other you know quote unquote fun stuff to do with Dracula's lore. But th- this is kind of one of those things that we wanted to that we've been like kind of chatting back and forth about, like. This is a great time to read old literature because it's all out of copyright, and yet at the same time, it's all cheaply and and effectively freely distributed on the internet for your reading pleasure at any time. And so there's never been a better time to read these classics because, you know, 20 years ago, you would have had to go to Barnes & Noble and find somebody that reprinted it. And today, you can just go online and find a text version or a PDF version or a scan of an actual book. And that's true of a lot of good books these days, and, uh, you know, this is kind of a good time to look back at our roots as far as, as, as you know, as it, as it stands, based on these writers from 100 years ago or more than 100 years ago who did amazing things, and now we can, you know, view the results of their work without any cost to ourselves except for time reading it. Or to put it another way, there's a lot of crap that you're spending money on these days when you could buy when you could get stuff for free that was written a long time ago and is way better than you'd think it is. Okay, so that's another written. that's another way yeah. to put it. Yeah. So 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 the copy that I have is a is a scan of a library of a of a of a copy that was from the Modern Library series. It's 440 pages. I mean, it's a sizable book. It took me several sittings to read. And you know the cool thing about well, like, the cool thing about this is that all these books have incarnations in, like, the modern culture, but those incarnations are not necessarily good adaptations of them. They either take liberties or they 
make things more sensational than they were in the book. They paper they, they paper over the subtle bits of the book to bring out the more flamboyant bits of the book. And it, sometimes it's nice to sit down and actually read what the actual author wrote instead of what some person who didn't really care, working, you know, in a sensational medium, decided to make the book out to be. I mean, I didn't even know that Dracula was a book when the movie came out. I just thought Bram Stoker was some movie-making dude. You know, you know only... I did too back in the day. Yeah, because, you know, <laughs> what the heck. I, and I mean, we're going to talk about this in a different episode, but the same, but a similar thing is true of Phantom of the Opera. I thought the Phantom of the Opera is just some crappy musical. It turns out that it's another one of these gothic horror novels from the late 1800s. And uh, I, I may be a and little it's also off on a the fantastic date, book. But it's, it's also supposedly a fantastic book. I've read the first couple of chapters, so I can't give a full um, evaluation of that book. But I mean, it it's interesting that these things are just never really like told explicitly to us. We all know that The Phantom of the Opera was a musical, like a theater musical, but we don't know, or, well, I didn't know, that there was actually a really solid novel behind it. Yeah, I I was, um, I was of the opinion that Dracula was a better book than Phantom of the Opera, but they're very similar in a lot of ways. Sure. And the, uh, the way that they're, re- like, I'm reading through this book, and there's a lot of things in both of these books that if you if you happen upon a writer's forum or if you hop on to Twitter or Instagram and hang out with the writing crew, you'll see a lot of people giving advice, telling you not to write things, and then you read these books and you're like, but this is stuff that all of these guys did and these books are fantastic. Yeah. I, I, I just kind of want to point that out because there's a lot well, of... Well, can you be a little more specific? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm struggling to think of an exact example, but there's a lot of like like you said, there's a lot of uh, shifting of perspective. Yeah. A lot of modern writers are like that's a no no, which I think is silly. I mean, the best book I wrote has you know jumps from third to first person here and there. You just have to know how to do it. Yeah, I I, I think that a lot of people try to try to like make what is a good guideline into a rule a lot of times in the world of writing. And it's, it's usually always a guideline, like starting sentences with and so, and, but is not a hard rule. No, it's a guideline that you shouldn't do that. But if it's what works and if it's the tone you're going for, by all means do it. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's the elements of style, right? There's books, there's books like that, but all of the things that they said are guidelines, not proscriptions. They're, they're, possibilities, their their uh, suggestions, but oftentimes when you're writing, especially when you're writing fiction, you have to take liberties with that. Uh, you know, a good example would be I just recently reread uh, Lovecraft's The Shadow The Shadows Over In- The Shadow Over Innsmouth. I think I got the name right there. And, you know, Lovecraft's use of dialect in that book is very notable. And the dialect doesn't follow the proper and correct rules of English grammar. But that's okay because it accurately describes the way that a real person would talk, which is its goal. Yeah, that's that's another thing. You you can choose to write character dialogue in ways that are both either very much like an actual person would talk, or you can refine it for the written word. Both of which are legitimate ways to write. Yes, but one of the things that some people fail to do with that is to be consistent. You want to be consistent if you do that. Like, like if, if you're making everyone talk like they're, you know, let's say they're more posh than any normal person would be, you can't just have them devolve into guttural speak, you know, on the next page. Right. But getting back to Dracula... Yes. The, the tone of the story is entirely one of... Well, it, it's it's very despairing, but at the same time, it's one of one of which you've got a you've got a touch of mystery, and you meet these characters that are trying to solve this mystery, and one one character in particular who is very interested in resolving a crisis that he sees unfolding before him. Yes, and this was probably the most interesting thing about the book because the character in question is um is Van Helsing. And oh God, what was his first name? They said uh, it, they only said it. Abraham, yeah, Abraham Van Helsing. Abraham Van Helsing in this book is so far removed from any depiction 
I have ever seen a Van Helsing in any media that it was just, it was almost disturbing that so many people had gotten that wrong. Well, they, uh, because they, I believe they got it wrong deliberately because what they were typically doing was trying to produce an action film or something like that, where what they needed was a, a swashbuckling, you know, action hero. And Van Helsing is not a swashbuck, swashbuckling action hero. He is almost... Almost unhinged through <laughs> from the perspective of the other characters at various parts of the book, but he's a very cerebral character and not an action hero. Yeah, he's uh, he, he's an older man, so already you're you're looking at like like he enters the story, and I'm just like, oh, this this guy's not this guy is nothing like the real or this guy is nothing like the Van Helsing's and the other things I've seen. This is the no, real I, deal. I, I believe he says he's in his sixties in in the book. Yeah, and, and he's a he's a uh, he's a doctor. He's a professor. He's from, studied medicine and many other things, yeah. and he has a very open mind about the things he sees before him. Well, so and he approaches a, it with a with, sort of yeah. logical, like, he approaches science the way that you would hope that most people would. Right. With, with an open mind to, th to things that are out of the ordinary and not just to brush it off. Like, like, this is the best book I've ever read where someone broke down the scientific process into, into an explanation of what it means to actually be science. At one point in the book, he is talking about methods of science and how many scientists of the modern day uh, become entangled in what they've been taught are the methods of science. And so that anything that doesn't fit within those methods can be discarded. Right. And and so he, I, I think in one of the later chapters, he starts describing Dracula as this thing that has shielded itself from inspection, shielded itself from anyone's ability to really uh, look into what's going on because he is so shrouded in the supernatural and in things that make little sense to the normal person Yeah, that science would look at it and be like, well, that can't possibly be real, so this is just superstitious nonsense, when in fact this just become this becomes a shield for Dracula in the story, is that nobody's willing to look at him like something that actually exists. Yeah. Well, no one's, no one, no one, it's, it's interesting because unlike, say, you know, a movie near dark where all they did was basically say, have no character utter the word vampire, the word vampire is uttered multiple times in the word, in the book of Dracula, but most of the characters, with the exception of Van Helsing at the start of the book and other characters later on, you know, it's seen as a, a creature of superstition, of, of folklore, of, of, of wi old wives' tales, and what happens is that there's a series of increasingly escalating events that gradually prove Van Helsing's fears correct and convinces all the other main characters that they have to go on this, you know, basically crusade against this this uh, undead monster. And it's actually a, it, it's actually a stage further than just that. Uh, be, because early on when Van Helsing appears in the book, I, I think he appears like, maybe a quarter of the way or maybe a little more into the book. And once he shows up, you kind of see him, you, you get a hint early on that he's looking at things in a different manner. And as time goes on, you get the impression that he's slowly forming a conclusion about there being something more to this uh, disease he's he's investigating. This yes. This woman is sick. And he's immediately looking into all these things that are kind of not off the wall, but like it's it's a secret. Like the reader doesn't get to see everything he's researching. But you get the sense that he's not doing normal things pretty quickly. Well, well, I and mean, he, he he does spend some time eliminating certain yeah real you know realistic ex uh, possibilities that could be happening. For instance, he says that he's basically checked Lucy for internal bleeding and he hasn't found any things like that. So you know he goes through the typical medical procedure, but he doesn't rule out the possibility of things that he's not capable from a medical perspective of judging. Yeah, and it's it works well within the framework of the story because he does get to the point where the reader can tell that he's convinced that something different is going on. But from the time he knows it to the time that everyone else knows it, a lot of interesting things happen where he's being hush-hush about a lot of things and he's basically drawing on his trust from people that know him yeah. to uh, to experiment in ways in which towards the, towards the end of this portion of his investigation, 
he's finally able to reveal to one of the other characters exactly what his thoughts are and what he thinks is going on because he has slowly led this person down the same path he went down and brought them to the same conclusions. And then in a final desperate, you know, not desperate, but like in a final bid, he, he you know, he tells this person he's known as, he's known for a very long time, one of his closest friends, what his thoughts are. And after everything that they went through, he's able to convince his friend that, yes, this is indeed something strange happening uh, that, you know, may have may have something to do with something more than science can currently explain. Yeah. So so that part of the book is probably the most interesting. It's it's a lot there's a lot to think about as it's going on and the, it's the, fun the to early, think about the it. The early middle part is very, very solidly written because it is yeah. it is tense and there's this constant escalation and there's this sense that the reader knows what's going on, but what what's interesting is the way that the characters are brought around to that to that perspective. And it takes the different characters a different amount of time to get there, and and there are issues that happen too. Like, uh, I mean, so one of the one of the elements of the story, right, is at the very beginning of the story, it's about Jonathan Harker, and he's gone to this castle to teach to basically teach this count how to how to buy and and uh, deal with real estate in London or in the civilized world in general, and um, you know, basically he ends up a prisoner there, and. He escapes, but one of the things that is, but 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 he basically ends up in a hospital, you know, delirious, and he's not really sure what is real and what isn't. He has memories, but he doesn't trust them because he because he was under this illness for such a long time. And this is an interesting aspect of kind of like the the previous era of 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 medical thought, in the sense that people. Did and uh, and you know not infrequently uh, found themselves not believing their own senses. Basically, like uh, there, I was just reading about. Uh, I think it was John Otis Jr. who was uh, was one of the people who you know uh, was part of the American founding back in the late 1700s, and he basically got hit in the head one at one point, and from that point on, he had. You know these 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 chronic situations where he, like he he was just insane, and then he would have moments he would have sometimes of lucidity and sometimes of insanity, until he finally died by being struck by lightning. But but like this is the kind of thing that happened a lot in like medical situations back then. People would have these fevers, and they didn't have drugs to make the fevers go down and keep them lucid. So they would have these horrible hallucinogenic dreams, and they would not know what was real and what was fake. They would have false memories implanted by their, you know, fever-addled brains. You know, there's a lot of there was a lot of that back in the day, and we we don't have that so much these days. People generally are told when they were delirious, and then they kind of believe it. <laughs> At least that's the experience that I've had of, of people having bad fevers, and and people have really bad fevers that cause hallucinations much less often these days as well. So this is one of those elements of the story that is interesting because it basically Harker experiences all of this and then he basically is brought to not believe it by his own sickness from it, which causes him to not be the first person to be enlisted into the, into the thing, into their, into their crusade. But, but, you know, once, once some evidence is shown him, shown to him, he's like, oh, then it looks like a lot of the things that I thought were hallucinations were not. And that means we're in big trouble. Yeah, if you've ever had to convince anyone of something that's outside the scope of their world narrative, anyone knows how difficult a task that could be. And there had to be such a culmination of events, even in this book, for it to make sense. And it makes perfect sense when it all finally comes around to it. It's very yeah. well written. Yes. But there, there, were, uh, there wasn't just the investigations of Van Helsing. There were also... A couple of remarkable coincidences, one being that the woman that he was investigating had several friends, one of which was the woman who intended to be married to Jonathan Harker. Right. Now, now, if that coincidence hadn't come around, the they wouldn't have had the opportunity to get at Dracula as they did. Whereas there's also these three gentlemen that were all in love with the woman who originally fell ill. Yes, Lucy. Yeah, Lucy. And each one of them, when they find out she's ill, each one of them comes around 
precisely at a time when they they need them to do a blood transfusion. They cannot figure out where Lucy's blood keeps going. It's just it's the case of the vanishing blood. And and so first, w- one of the doctors that is helping Van Helsing is a friend of Lucy's, and he had asked her to marry uh, marry him. But he was older, and she had someone else in mind, and so she declined him. But of course, he's going to you know try and save her because you know, he loves her. So he was the he was the second one to do a blood transfusion with her. The first one was the man that was originally going to marry her, or did marry her. And then after that, there were uh, was it two more? Wait, am I forgetting someone? So, no, so, it was so one more. It was one more. It was Quincy Morris or Seward. Seward Seward is the doctor. I'm yeah. pretty sure. Didn't she marry Seward? Or am I getting that wrong? No, no, it was Anthony. Uh, Son of a gun, what was his last name? The Lord Godalming God, God or whatever? Uh, yeah, I believe so. It was it was him, and then Quincy Morris is the only one I, I remember because he's American, so he's the only one that matters. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. So, but no, I, it was, I, so, it was so, these yeah. three men, all of whom at some point ended up giving her a blood transfusion, and on top of that... And uh, Van Helsing as well. Van Helsing had to as well, because it was just constant. It was like, where the heck is her blood going? And... These these three men were, you know, they were now in the fold, kind of, of, oh, there's something really bad going on here. So at some point, Van Helsing kind of creates this group of people and brings them together, knowing that they have something they have to do that's going to require a lot of help. Yeah. And if it, if it wasn't for these coincidences of people keeping journals at the right times and talking about the right things and Jonathan Harker having been the one to met uh, to meet Dracula at the beginning of the book and the fact that Lucy's good friend Mina is Harker's well ends up as Harker's wife yes nothing none of this would have even with all of Van Helsing's you know work that he put into this none of this probably would have led them to actually finding Dracula uh, without these coincidences, so it's it's kind of it's kind of a good combination of showing just how hard it can be to convince people of something, and showing you know just how much of that relies on luck. Very good commentary on uh, I I guess on political discourse or maybe economic discourse. I think, uh-huh, uh-huh. though unintentional, or or maybe not. I mean, I I get the feeling that Bram Stoker had been in some circumstances where he tried to convince people of things and couldn't, and that's where a lot of that came from. I feel like it's got that kind of energy to it. Yeah, possibly. But but yeah, he, so we've got this doctor that's or, or this professor that's an old man, and he really knows his stuff, but he's no sword-swinging, swashbuckling, uh, firearm-wielding hero. He's just a guy who's really intelligent and formulates throughout the book several plans to continuously corner Dracula into a position in which Dracula is forced to flee from them, which is way different than I thought the book would turn out. Like, like I thought everyone would be basically fleeing from him the whole time, or they would they would discover him, and it would be an extraordinary event in which they uh, headed off to do him in. I'm I'm trying to think of what the first the first thing was that they did they 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 kind of they kind of went around ruining all the spots that dracula had set up for himself that were basically the well, so, uh, the so, vampire so equipment the old story the, the the story is that dracula basically takes dracula needs to basically have dirt from his homeland in order to survive uh and so he basically ships 50 50 crates of dirt to london and then uses and then puts them in various places and uses them as bases of operation, right? Yeah. So it's a CIA safe house for a vampire. Something like that. But like, you know, it's 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 interesting because originally, you know, Harker only helps him by one place. And there's this great reveal kind of, you know, in the early middle of the story where they're like, "Oh, you also taught him how to also buy his own things and tr- and have things moved around anonymously." This is bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny too because at some point in the story, it, it, it's it's like, 
I'm trying to remember because the first part of the book was really good too. Everything that happened where Jonathan Harker was in the castle was well, so, that, that was yeah. another really good part of the book. Harker in the castle is a riveting is a riveting story by itself. Like it could yeah. be uh, like a solid novella of its own self. It, yeah, these days authors with... authors that I've met these days would probably look at the idea of the Dracula story and be like, "Ooh, if I did that, it would be a three part series because everyone just loves to write their series in books. Uh, yeah. Again, something that comes from algorithms, but of course it's it, I, someone definitely would have, would have written that part and then brought out another book to go through, you know, everything that happened with Van Helsing. And then they would have made a, a book way too long at the end where they actually, hunt down and kill Dracula because that, that part kind of, that part's a lot shorter than everything else that happens in the book. That's like right at the end of the book, they do all that. Well, I mean, there's a, there's a long period near the end of the book where they're, where basically the chase is on, but yeah. they, but there's no action to it. It's just, it's just, and it's actually they're, a little, it's actually a little bit anticlimactic, honestly, because you go through, you know, nearly a hundred pages of them trying to chase down Dracula to ha- to end up with like it's like three paragraphs of action and then the book is over, which is yeah, that, fine. That's kind but... of that's kind of why I wanted to say that you know I'm I'm totally gonna spoil this book yeah. for people because that the ending is just it's so funny after everything you go through and after all the planning and all the uh, all the ideas that they use to uh, get at Dracula to corner him, <laughs> and then the book is just like a couple of guys running up onto a cart and flipping the coffin off the cart, like, ha, ah, and ripping it open and just cutting his head off and stabbing yeah. him through the heart, and then that's it. That's the end of the book. Pretty much. But really, I mean, there's a lot of really interesting character work done here, because you have a lot of different, you know, a lot of characters with different perspectives, and you get to see their different perspectives on the same, on the same events in some cases and you get to see how their different positions in society you know basically have for, force them into circumstances that 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 help to push forward the story like a, a big element of the middle the early middle part of the story is that um lucy is kind of pretty much all all on her own because her husband arthur is stuck he, he's basically been uh he's t- basically inherited a lordship when his father died and so now he has a bunch of like random work and bureaucratic stuff to deal with. And so she is alone a lot, which makes her a more, an easier target for Dracula, basically. Yeah, and this is kind of a masterwork on character development. Yes. The, the characters in this book are all, someone might at a glance think that these are thin characters, but they're really just very subtle characters. Like, like yes. all of the character traits for these characters are developed in very subtle ways. When you get to the end of the book, you have a very good idea of the levels of intelligence or passion or bravery of each of the characters. Yeah. And you, you do have a sense of the different personalities that each character has. Well, there's also um, there's also a very important element here of that. There's a division of labor between the characters in the in the final chase, especially like they all have their own particular roles to serve, and those roles are suited toward what you've already learned about their their particular strengths and weaknesses. And, yeah, you know, the two the two men who rush the the cart are Harker and Quincy, and they're the two that are the most you know intelligent and. Not, not 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 most most active physically active of the, of the group, and we see that in various scenes throughout the rest of the book. That you have uh, Van Helsing working with Mina to kind of be their uh, their intelligence organization. Basically, uh, you have uh, Arthur Godalming, Lord Godalming, um, dealing with all of the oh you're going to need horses, oh you're going to need a boat, oh you're going to need this, oh you're going to need a name to 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 get onto this boat to look and see if these boxes are there kind of thing. Every character has their own strengths and weaknesses and and they they use those strengths and weaknesses in a deliberate way to achieve their goals, which is something that a lot of books kind of forget about sometimes. Yeah, I'm I'm still kind of laughing at the idea that it, for some reason the only character whose full name I was able to rem- well, I I remember Jonathan Harker and Quincy Morris, and it's it's just funny that the one person I remember was one of my least favorite characters in the book, because 
You know, I liked Quincy Morris. I didn't like him that much until it got to uh, a couple of the scenes where it became apparent that he would be the first one to dive into battle or, you know, do what has to be done, uh, yeah. especially for the sake of the, the people that he loved. And they carried that out through to the end because he's uh, he's one of the characters in the book that, that bites it doing exactly that. So, yeah. So now I've spoiled a lot of the major things that happen in the book, but well, it's a hundred and thirty year old book. It's worth reading. It is it's very still, worth reading. Even even knowing what the plot is, even if you've seen the movie, even if you've seen all the pop culture gibberish that uses it as a template, the book is still worth reading because it's such an excellent like case study in writing from multiple perspectives, in writing from a journal perspective, in collecting different different pieces of writing from different sources and making them sound appropriate. One of the things that's very interesting about the book is that there are a bunch of bits where it's basically a newspaper clipping or something like that. And the tone of the writing changes drastically in that, in that, in, in those little points. And it's just nice to see that happen. Each of the characters has a very different voice, has a very different way to, to a different way that they see the other characters. Uh, it's, it's really a masterwork in that sense and, and worth studying for that reason. Yeah. There's a portion of the book where it's, it's a newspaper interview with this man who was in charge of a wolf cage at a zoo. Right. And the man that's interviewing him, uh, is he's, he kind of had to bribe his way into the interview because the wolf tamer wolf keeper, uh, is a very brusque man. And, yeah. It's it's kind of like I'm reading it and thinking this is the comic gravedigger portion of this book, because <laughs> uh, him and his wife are just like they're they're kind of taking jabs at the interviewer and you know it's at first it seems like the wife is there to make sure the husband keeps his cool but then she's laughing at his jokes when uh what what is it he tells the he tells the interviewer that the interviewer asks uh, what happened why did the wolf escape and he goes well because it wanted to. <laughs> and you know, he's he's kind of giving him a hard time. It, it's everything about the book. Just it, it has its own little tone in every passage. And I I could tell you everything that happens with every character. Well, I could tell you every, I could tell you the outcome for every character in the book, and it would still be worth reading because it's the build up. It's it, it's a chase is better than the catch moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's definitely an element of that in this book for sure. Yeah, especially everything that happens with Van Helsing building up to them deciding that they were going to that they're going to go after Dracula. Yeah. It's very interesting. There there's a there's a like, like the situation with Lucy and the way that Van Helsing handles it and then the way that Van Helsing handles the aftermath. It's a very interesting kind of things are built up and and you kind of get to see how real everything is at the same time as a couple of the characters do and and that's that's also very gratifying to read. It's so it's a good it's a good section of the book because it's, you basically you basically are like well I mean come on you know I totally understand why these characters are skeptic and then a minute minute later you're like okay I understand why these characters are not skeptical anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah it it doesn't th just throw it at you it it doesn't just have these moments like you see in a lot of movies and books where all of a sudden everyone's just like well look I think it's a vampire and they're like you know what that makes sense let's go with that and then everyone's <laughs> on the vampire bandwagon right. No, no. By the time by the time you get there, you fully understand why people would believe Van Helsing. Well, so the interesting another interesting point is that the the vampire powers are used in a much more indirect way than they are in a lot of other media that that uses Dracula as a template. Dracula makes very few appearances in the book itself. Yeah, he he he's actually a very like he he has a, he has the air of a of a of a kindly old man at the start of, of Harker's visit to him. But then as Harker gets more and more suspicious and more and more uh, worried, he, he maintains the air of, of servility while at the same time having a, a more sinister feel behind him as well. That part's very well done. But like, we don't see Dracula, like they say Dracula has the power of, or has the strength of 20 men. But we never really see that. Uh, what we see instead is him using his abilities to deal with fog to command bats and wolves and and uh, and other animals, basically, he uses that stuff a lot. He uses his ability to like hypnotize people a lot. Uh, there's not really a lot of 
Like for 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 a, for a monster that has the strength of twenty men, you never really see him exert that, which is an interesting choice. But it makes sense because you only have what five or six six or so main characters, and if Dracula has the strength of twenty men and they have a uh, you know a, a face-to-face encounter, Dracula's going to win. And so the characters are desperate to avoid that confrontation and to and to you know deal with Dracula by attacking his weaknesses and, and, and avoiding a direct confrontation, basically. It's a really interesting way that things are put together. And it's a good way to see how to do, how to deal with, how to deal with monsters without turning everything into a, you know, a, a, a giant explosion blockbuster kind of thing. Yeah. The, the storytelling is immaculate. Yes. And there's like, there's a lot of early scenes where they're in the castle and Jonathan Harker, is he he's very quickly he's wondering about some of the strange things that are going on even before they get to the castle there's this weird moment where they're riding on a cart and there's wolves running alongside them and the coachman jumps off the cart and runs off and and Harker's just left there like what was that about and then he <laughs> sees a man in the distance like waving his arms and he realizes the man's waving his arms at these wolves and they run off and he's like well what the heck is that about yeah, and then they get to the castle, and it's not very long after they get to the castle, where you know he meets Count Dracula, and they go inside, and and after a while he's like, I started to get the suspicion that Count Dracula himself had been the coachman that brought me here this whole time. Yeah, and he's you know he's sitting around at one point. He's had several meals at this castle now. He's stayed several nights. And he's just like, I never see any servants. There's no servants about whatsoever. And then he catches Dracula setting his breakfast table, and he's just like, he's been making my breakfast this whole time. Why is he alone in this castle? What in the world is going on in this place? Yeah, yeah. It's it's just everything, and it's a very it's a very long. It's not like you know half the book, but it's a long part of the of of a you know big book. Yeah, where he's in this castle and he fi- he realizes at some point he's a prisoner in the castle, and he just keeps as the build up to that gets nearer and nearer, he keeps seeing these strange things that, you know, more and more he's kind of uneasy about where he is, and then something happens that just it just like blows the veneer of any kind of safety away, and he's just like, I am in a world of demons. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a there's a very strong atmosphere of desperation that 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 gets built up because because it's not just that Harker gets left it's not just that Harker is alone in the castle with the count it's that the count actually kind of at at the end of this section of the book the count basically leaves and Harker is left there you know alone so to speak but not really alone there's other inhabitants of the castle that Harker is not supposed to have met but it's you know it's a um, you know, Harker Harker manages to escape, kind of against all odds. That's a very good part of the book uh, as well, and it sets a stage for everything because you now know that that Dracula has left his castle. He's gone to London. He's bought a property, and Har- and and Harker has you know kind of discovered the horrors of of Dracula's existence. But then you get this cutoff where Harker is out of the story for the next fifty pages or so convalescing in a in a sick house <laughs> in a sanatorium in in uh in Romania or something like that. Yeah. And uh <laughs> and and everybody else has to deal with the build up of Dracula arriving in London without having the, the information from Harker and frankly with, without Harker even believing that information himself once he once he gets over his his illness. He's also clearly at a height of despair at several points throughout his, you know, stay in the castle. And this entire segment of the book gives you a lot of information about Dracula without really without you realizing you have that information until he yeah. reappears later on in the story. Uh, all of the clues that uh, you get at the castle become relevant to you understanding what's going on later in the book, such as the Jonathan Harker's discovery that Dracula has no reflection, which is a turning point in the book where Dracula notices that he has a mirror and he flings it from a window and suddenly the 
the tension rises between them because now it is clear to Jonathan Harker that Dracula's plan is to get the information he needs out of him, get his help, and then kill him. Yes. Which he outright says at one point, and Harker overhears. You know, up until then, he's given several warnings about places he shouldn't go, and there's a part of the castle. He, he He's told never to fall asleep in certain parts of the castle, and of course that happens, and you get to see that there are actually other vampires in the castle. There are uh, these three women that Dracula keeps, and his his ultimate plan is to feed on Jonathan Harker and then feed, and then let them take the leftovers. Yes. And Harker becomes aware of this, so he gets more and more desperate to try to escape as time goes on. And it's very, again, like the Van Helsing thing, this is a very cerebral thing that happens in the story, because now Harker knows that he's a prisoner and that he's doomed. And at the same time, Dracula is forcing him to write letters to fool people into thinking that he's going to be leaving the castle and that he'll be on his way home. And, and so yeah. he's, he makes Harker write these letters and the times for delivery that he puts on the letters kind of give him a date. He he ultimately knows when Dracula is planning on killing him. Yeah. And he can find no way out of the castle, except for, of course, the way he takes, which leads him to being in the hospital. Right. But it's it's a lot of a lot of weird things that just like you have a sense of his isolation because he's in a castle where there's things that could kill him right around the corner, and he knows this. And Dracula could kill him, and he knows this. And he can't exactly run right out of the castle because Dracula has an army of wolves at his command, and he's seen a woman torn to shreds by these wolves. There's there's this moment in the in the castle segment where Jonathan Harker is talking about witnessing Dracula dressing as him and going into town to give the illusion that Harker is not always in the castle. So right. that when people ask questions, they'll be like, no, we saw him in town. And, and apparently Dracula had done something, murdered a woman's baby or something while in disguise. And so this woman comes to the castle and starts shouting at Jonathan Harker. And then these wolves just show up and tear her to pieces right outside the window. Well, I mean, the Count offers to let Jonathan Harker leave and basically opens the door for him to leave. And But, you know, he's got control of these wolves. And so the wolves basically prevent Harker from, from leaving. Yeah. It's yeah, one of those so things he, where, he, 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 where, where, where Dracula kind of makes him feel like he's the architect of his own imprisonment to a certain degree. Because, like, he, 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 he feels like he could get out, but that, that everything is stacked against him to the degree that... He doesn't really try until the very end where he just kind of gets so desperate that he decides, well, I'm going to just do this crazy thing and, you know, hopefully I survive. But if I don't, it's better than being eaten. Yeah. And it's it really does feel like a story in and of itself. Like if Lovecraft had been writing it, that probably would have been the whole story. (laughs) It's a, a much shorter tale. Yeah. And I mean, it 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 felt like a really good story in its own and then to have it continue into something that i mean frankly i feel like the van helsing part was even better yeah it it was uh i mean it was was just it was just a really good book just go read it right now yeah yeah, go read the book it's free (laughs) yeah we're we're just we're, we're just at this point now where i haven't seen the movie and i have a i have a little more faith that the movie will actually be somewhat decent given that the scene that turned me off from watching it in the first place is actually in the book so so i have a little bit of confidence that maybe the movie is worth seeing maybe they stuck to a lot of what actually happens in the book but in every other vampire thing that i can think of and and i like a lot of you know vampire stuff books and movies no it's not um, that it's bad it's that it's 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 not that it's bad that's not what we're trying to say it's that it's that a a cerebral and you know slow burning source material has been turned into this crazy explodey blockbuster and that's you know you lose something when you do that and you gain something too but you but it's important to note that you also lose something yeah they they michael bayed a lot of the yeah. dracula canon and but but not like not not in a way that it's like oh it's a michael bay film this is crap i'm not even going to bother watching it it's some of it's worth seeing 
I won't count Twilight among those. My God, I can't believe that's a thing. Uh, <laughs> more, <laughs> more power to anyone that can make a fortune off of whatever Twilight was supposed to be. Right. But I like something a little more visceral from my vampires than performing C-sections. So... So I know there was there was that Van Helsing movie that I remember seeing it in theaters and yeah, I did too. I did I didn't exactly hate it. A lot of people said it was a really bad movie after the fact, but I remember watching it just like yeah. I mean, it's an action flick, whatever. Yeah, it's an action movie with what's his face in it. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, it, it was the same for for the movie Solomon Kane. It didn't yeah. really cover any of the actual Solomon Kane stories. Wasn't the greatest movie, but it was good enough that I enjoyed sitting down and watching it. Sure. There's there's definitely... The fact that Bram Stoker's Dracula has that much of an influence on even modern vampire stories yeah. without anyone necessarily even... Like, like, a lot of people are writing vampire stories three generations removed from the original story at this point. Like, like a lot of it looks like Castlevania fan fiction sometimes. Yeah. And and then there's actually, you know, Castlevania stuff. Like, you know, there's there was a Castlevania cartoon on Netflix. And yes, yes. I I wasn't particularly impressed with it, and from what I hear, you know, you know, I, I saw the first season, couldn't couldn't bring myself to watch the rest of it, but I heard it kinda went downhill by the third season. Yeah, I don't I saw part of the first season, I think, but I don't remember it. It was years ago. Yeah, it I I think that they could have uh well, so there's an interesting there's an interesting little point that I want to just bring up, and that's that the sunlight doesn't kill Dracula; it just takes away his powers. In the book, oh uh, yeah, and, yeah, that, that and this is one of those me. things that is that is uh, most often sensationalized by modern interpretations of the vampire story, because we always have these crazy scenes of like a couple of rays of sunlight hitting the vampire, and he screams and burns and smokes and and flails around and. Maybe he catches fire and he sets something else on fire or something like that. And all, all that the sun does in in the book is basically turn him into a regular person. And, it, you know, it, it's, 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 it's uncomfortable to him. He tends to sleep during the day. But they, they, do, they do have evidence of him walking around in daylight in London. So, you know, it's not like... It's not like he burns burns up if he's touched by... It. It's one of those things where they basically... Where people created a weakness where there wasn't one before. And that's interesting because you didn't need to go, because this book doesn't need that weakness in order to make things work out. It, but like other writers needed that weakness because they exaggerated his strengths as well, perhaps his his ability to make direct confrontations and things like that. There's a lot of that going on. Yeah, I mean, I'm guilty of that. Sure. I. I mean, it's not I, it, again. It's the, not the bad. It's just. Was... It's just that. It's just that it's taking something subtle and making it unsubtle. And when you do that, you lose the subtlety, and subtlety is not always a bad thing. No, it's it's not. I mean, it's I I'm going on about people Michael Bayifying Dracula, but I'm I'm guilty of I, I use the sunlight thing. It's actually central to a book I wrote, and yeah, it's go <laughs> and hilariously enough, it's an action book. So it's it's like yeah, I I kind of Michael Bayified it too, but it it's nice that so much has come out of. Just this one book that you know people blew up to an extraordinary proportion, and now it's it, it's in so much media at this point. I mean, there's almost nothing vampire out there that doesn't in some way connect back to the original Bram Stoker's Dracula. Pretty much, yeah. And you know, nobody's going to argue that you know. I mean, Castlevania uses the name Dracula. Nobody's going to argue that that fr entire franchise wasn't drawn from that. Sure. There's, there's a couple of things where it's, uh, you know, like a lot of the vampire stories get away from the whole garlic and, uh, well, you know, so the, the various the, like holy the, weaknesses. The, the the tropes that the tropes that modern stories use is that they, is that they downplay the downplay some of the weaknesses and and bring up another one, right? So you know, oh, you know, he's not weak to crucifixes, he's not weak to garlic, you know, but he is weak to this or he is weak to that. And so there's some of that going on in modern interpretations, and what that does, you know, the purpose of that is to sh is basically to say, not all superstitions are correct. Where 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 whereas in Dracula the book, you know, the the superstitions that 
that Van Helsing knows about and tries all seem to work for the most part. Yeah. And so, you know, this that, that, that that's a totally reasonable thing to do as a as a as an author coming later is to say, oh, but this this weakness that you thought that such and such had is actually a superstition and not true. And, you know, that that creates an opportunity to to increase the tension or put a character in danger, things like that. So, you know, it's it's one of those things where where you can where where you know it's it, it, I expect people to do it, but at the same time, it is a, de, a you know a departing from the source material in ways that should be at least noted and considered if you're gonna write something, or or if you're gonna read something that that is based on this work. Now, one of my favorite interpretations of the uh, vampire tropes. Have you ever read Masquerade by Terry Pratchett? I've not. Oh, it, it is. It is absolutely wonderful. There's this moment in the book, this vampire family, the head vampire had for the longest time taught his family to overcome the supposed weaknesses of vampires. They would practice eating garlic and they would, I, I'm trying to remember if they tried to stay out in sunlight or not. It's been a while since I read it, but uh, one of the things that they did, this this was this was just absolute gold. They had forced their children to stare at uh, stare at cards showing religious symbols so that they wouldn't be frightened of them if they saw them because uh-huh. it was all in their head as 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 they said. Yeah. And at the end of close to the end of the book, the hero Granny Weatherwax, she's actually bitten by the vampires and she's in danger of becoming a vampire herself. But she's also probably the most powerful witch in all of Discworld, if not the most powerful magical magic user on the entire disc. And she reverses the spell, and instead of her becoming a vampire, they become like her. And while she doesn't really care about the religious symbols, she doesn't acknowledge that they're actually holy symbols. She doesn't... Uh, she acknowledges that they're actually holy symbols. And so they're acting more like her, and now they're looking around, and the kids are just like, why did you teach us all of these symbols? Now every crack in the wall that we see looks like one of them, and they're just freaking <laughs> out. Yeah, It's absolutely wonderful. That, that, that's, that's a great vampire book, if anyone wants to take all the tropes, all the vampire tropes all in one in the funniest way possible. Masquerade is a great book. I'll have to give it a look. I mean, pretty much anything with Granny Weatherwax was great. Pretty much anything uh, by Terry Pratchett was great. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Bram Stoker's Dracula definitely worth a read. I, I feel like there needs to. I, I feel like I need to go back and find more books like this. I don't know how much gothic horror it was written at that time. Yeah, Phantom of the Opera was great. Dracula was great. I'm not aware of any other major. I works. guess Frankenstein is another candidate. I, I've read Frankenstein. It didn't really come off the same the same way those two books did. No, that's uh, fair. And, it's, just, it's just one that I hear lumped in with them a, a lot. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what else there is. I'm I'm hoping that there's a lot more of it because they're very well written. Phantom of the Opera is it's another one that we'll talk about sometime. Yeah, but there's a lot going on at the beginning of the book that I mean, a lot of it is making me laugh at the beginning of the book. Uh, all the things that the ghost of the opera is doing, and then you get you get to the later parts of the book. Uh, h- how far how far are you into it? Am I going to be ruining just like anything? two or three chapters? I'm not very far in at all. Oh well, uh, it's okay. The book is a hundred is over a hundred years old. It's fine. Well, I'll put it like this. Sure. The Phantom of the Opera. By the time you get to the end of the book, it's like, wow, this guy is just a horrible, horrible person. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you kind of get that impression based on what his demands were uh, early in the book. Yeah, but at the beginning of the book, I'm I'm viewing it more as like an Arsène Lupin thing, where it's just like, yeah, this is pretty much my territory. I run things here, and he's just having a good time doing it. But then later in the book, you're well, like, no, this guy's messed up. <laughs> well, well, I mean, Arsène Lupin is not is not a, is not the is not the good guy, so to speak. He's he's a uh, no, but he's he's definitely more lovable than you're going to find the Phantom of the Opera by the time you. Oh, finish okay, that that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> Like, like, there's a certain charm about Lupin that is made expressly clear in the stories in that he's called France's national thief as kind yeah. of a foil to England's national detective. Right, right. And, and sometimes, you know, there will be parts of the books where newspapers are talking about him and 
the people of France are excited about the events that are happening surrounding Arsène Lupin, and many of them are, you know, getting laughs out of it. Yeah. So, so there's definitely a distinction there. But with the Phantom of the Opera, it's it's totally different. You you get to this part of the story which is like there is some weird stuff going on here, and there is this guy is <laughs> there's just something messed up about all of this. <laughs> well, I mean, he's he's squatting in the in the in the in the underbelly of a of a giant opera house i mean there's got to be something messed up with that guy not just an underbelly but like this giant underbelly fortress w- complete yes. with like with like misty moat and all this other nonsense and it's just like this is this is the work of a madman <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> I mean, at the very start of the book, they make the point that the that the opera house itself was kind of the work of a madman. Like all of the craziness of of what's actually underground there is just like it, it, it beggars belief, honestly. Yeah, yeah. And there's all these people that are working beneath the opera house that the owner of the opera house isn't even aware of. It's just like, what is all yeah. this? What? <laughs> I'm sorry, I bought a what now? There, there's people stoking <laughs> boilers. Where? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's just follow this completely book. black dirt path down here over a moat. And... Wait, we're in a building. Why is this a dirt path? <laughs> <laughs> Why does it go so deep underground? We we put people on stage to sing. What is happening here? <laughs> Why is there so much behind this? Yeah, I mean, this is one of those things where this is something that... Where, where, oh, so, 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 so this is, you know, me personally, but, like, I never really cared to read these books and I never really cared to buy them. Yeah, same here. Because it was it was it was expensive. You know, books books cost money when I was a kid. And so I got into the into the the habit of, you know, finding things that were, you know, more contemporary and therefore more, you know naively interesting, I guess would be the way to put it. But like we're now living in an era where all of these old works are freely available to you. Like, um, I don't know. I, I, I kind of did a, a little, a little, spent a little time wandering around archive and finding old books that I have never read, but want to read. I've got, you know, copies of Don Quixote. I've got a bunch of different stuff. Let me, let me just kind of bring up, let me, let me just kind of give you a couple of examples of things that I've found that seem like they would be good reading stuff that I've never read before. You know, and not just fiction, too. Like, um, you know, you can get a copy of Aristotle's book Politics in, in the original Greek or in English. You can get Don Quixote, I already mentioned. You can read, you know, essays from philosophers. You can get a lot of... I'm just scrolling here. This is probably boring. But, like, you know, I, I, I grabbed a copy of Moby Dick. I, uh... I've got Poor Richard, Poor Richard's Almanac, a bunch of that, Phantom of the Opera, People's Pottage, Letters by Montesquieu, Paradise Lost. You know, a lot of these old pieces of literature that, you know, you probably, you know, heard about them and then dismissed them as not really worth your time at some point. And now the the the, the amount of, of worth, not worth your time in the sense of like going to a bookstore and finding a good finding a good version of it kind of thing. But nowadays, you can just kind of grab this stuff and it's just right there for you. Uh, yeah, one of the one of the ones that I'm looking forward to reading that I never got my grubby little hands on was uh, yeah. The Count of Monte Cristo. Oh, that's a good one. I don't have that. I should pick that up. Absolutely. And and you're you're talking about like, like entire writing styles that people don't even use anymore. You can improve your writing a thousandfold by going back and reading these old books and just, you know, picking up on some of the ways that uh, authors used to write. Yeah. And like, okay, so I think, I think it was on Twitter earlier today. I had noticed someone was, uh, was asking the question, will I get better at writing if I write every day? Now with the stipulation that you have to kind of think about what it is you're writing in order for it to work. Yes, you will get better at writing if you write every day. Anything that you do every day, you will get better at. You well, breathe so, so, every single day of your life. You do it without thinking. Well, well. So there, there's a there's a phrase that I've heard in relation to firearms training, actually, that applies here. It's not that practice makes perfect; it's that practice makes permanent. And so, if you get into bad habits as a writer and maintain those bad habits, 
and you'll you'll find yourself stuck in those ways unless you make a really conscious effort to 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 minimize them. But if you if you on the other hand, if you read a variety of different authors from a variety of different eras, you will get to see kind of what works and what doesn't and and how writing has changed and by exposing yourself to a variety of different writing styles, you will, you know, assimilate little bits of those in, in, into your own personal style and and rather than just looking at your own stuff and trying to improve it, you can find things that have become timeless classics and try to understand why they have become timeless classics. It's also important to understand just how much, you know, just how much you can accomplish, even with just a little bit every day. Yeah. So, so since we're we're on the subject of writing, and we've already brought up Terry Pratchett once, Terry Pratchett, I believe he said it, said in an interview. Did we already talk about this? His four hundred words so. a day. No, yeah, no. Terry Pratchett wrote 400 words a day, according to some interview. And, you, you know, you think about that, and that's like barely more than a Twitter post. But you do the math, and you've got, you know, 10 days, that's 4,000 words. Well, 400, 400 words a, a day is, is way more Not than e- a Twitter post. But Well, it's, it's is, not is, even is, half a page, though. It's a short blog post. No, no, 400 words is about a, is, is, is about a page, depending uh, on the font size and stuff. Yeah, but. yeah, but, but like... That's that's not really a lot to type out. No, it's not. I mean, it's not. I sit down sometimes and I can get 5,000 words out in one day. You know, I've had days where I've gotten nearly 10,000 out in one day. But 400 words a day, you go 100 days, you've written, you know, you've got 4,000 at 10. You've got 40,000 at 100. That's almost a complete book right there. Less than half a year, you can crank out a novel. And that's how he consistently put out about two books a year. So... It, Imagine doing that with, you know, you've got a book you want to kind of adopt your st- uh, some of your style from. Like, you want to kind of write like Lovecraft. You read a page or two a day and kind of think about throughout the day after that, you know, how he structured his stories. Yeah. And you can you, you can learn a lot of different ways to word things very quickly just by doing that, you know, that, that minimal examination every single day you'll eventually see patterns develop. Well, so there's an interesting point here just to bring up. I think I may have said this before, but I recently saw someone how do I put this? They were like they they had given a page of their own work to some like modern day editor. And like the modern day editor was saying things like you use too many adjectives. And like I looked at I, I, I like looked at this post where like someone has written and read too many adjectives and I look at a a, a page of Lovecraft and I'm like I don't know that this editor knows what they're talking about. <laughs> Most of them don't. Most of them these days kind of have the same outlook. It's, it's like, so So this is good advice if you're writing maybe a textbook and you want yeah. to just reduce things down to as few words as possible. But when you're writing fiction, you can't necessarily tell the story you want to tell. I, I mean, if, if you reduce everything to the lowest common denominator and remove any excess well, adjectives from your writing, you're eventually going to have a point at which, and I think we've almost gotten there actually, where... Every modern author's writing sounds exactly the same, which well, I mean, is a complaint that you and I have both had. We can see this as a as like a sliding scale too, because there are writers like Hemingway, for instance, who got away with having this very sparse style. But part of writing engaging fiction is creating an image in your reader's mind of what's going on, or what you're seeing, or what they're seeing, and it's very difficult to do that without descriptive language. <laughs> So, you know, it's it's one of those things where, you know, you, you need to develop your own, you need to develop your own unique voice. And part of that is reading a variety of different authors from a variety of different times. Because try- what you'll do is you'll pick up the good parts of it that you like or that you that feel right to you. But every other person who reads those books is going to pick up on different elements. And those different elements are going to feel right to them. So it doesn't give you, it doesn't give you a voice that sounds like everybody else. It gives you your own unique nuanced voice everything many things have been written and you know if you just started writing without reading anything you would probably find that your style matched up with someone in the past so that's not a reason for you to avoid like 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 imitation or or you know coincidental similarities are not necessarily a bad thing and they're not necessarily something to be avoided because because those those become conventions of language <laughs> and and if you start messing around with conventions of language, you end up pushing away some readers because they're like, I don't, what are you doing? What is this kicksy winsy thing? 
<laughs> nice. Yeah. There's... Okay. Try to imagine that advice being given to someone in, in a visual medium. In like, 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 imagine someone who's a cartoonist and, yeah. or, or an artist, and it's, you, you've got someone editing their work like, well, you've got too many lines here. These are unnecessarily, unnecessary lines. These are unnecessary. This extra shading here really isn't necessary. And these lines over here, this, you know, this skew shading, you didn't need to do that. That's way too dark over here. And, and, and actually, you, you know, just imagine what you would, well, actually, now that I think about it, what you would end up with is probably CalArts, but yeah, <laughs> but, but everyone's art would look the same if everyone yes. was just like, cause that's advice that artists get. Some of the, some of the advice you'll get if you, you know, take up doing art is learn to draw things with as few lines as possible, but that's not, that's not how you create the art you want to create. That is practice to be able to understand how shapes work together and to get good at that. Well, and also not to not to waste effort, right? Like yeah. like you don't you, like there are plenty of people who have very distinct styles where they use cross hatching or something like that to do shading. And that's important because it gives your work a a unique look. And it's it's extra work, but sometimes that uniqueness is what people also want to see. So, you know, some 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 things require effort. And the pairing, the the, the 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 urge to pare things down to their most basic, to their most basic parts, is not something that you want to do as a creative necessarily. It's something you want to practice a little bit, so that you don't waste your time. Because you can easily waste your time writing, you know, garbage that no one wants to read, or writing garbage that's written in such a way that no one wants to read it. Uh, and if you can learn you know, what people are, what, what turns people off, basically, then you can, you can improve the marketability of your work, which is something that if you want to write in any relatively, even close to professional sense, that you need to do. You need to write things that people want to read and not just what you want to write, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I don't know. It's one of those things where you're, you, you know, you, you're creating things, but what, what they're worth is not determined by you. So... You might be losing a lot if you tried to reduce art. If you tried to reduce your artwork down to a caloric efficiency uh, yeah. of saving lines, you wouldn't be producing your best work. You'd be too busy thinking about caloric efficiency. I would. I would hazard against the application of the second law of thermodynamics in an equation form to writing or art. Yeah, <laughs> it is a wasteful thing, but that's okay. Because some people want that wasteful thing. I mean, I know I do, and God help well, us yeah. if we if we don't get some uh, get a future generation of authors in here that give me some retiring writing to read. Right, right. I'm gonna be seventy two years old and just be like, hey, it's, it's oh, it's got a it's, it's it's a title with like one little you know circle on the front of the I cover imagine, is a... I am, no, I've got this great image in my head of you, an ancient you in a bookstore and like, you're like you're like look, looking down the, down the aisles and you're looking at all the spines of the books and you're like, you kind of take a deep breath and you kind of sigh you're, you're, you're kind of resignedly and you like peel one book slowly out of the, out of the, out of the shelf and you open it up and you, and like your eyes dart to a part of the page where the words "sparkling vampire" appear, and you snap the book closed and shove it back into the into the into the thing and pull out the next book and you open it other, to another random page and again your eyes are drawn to the phrase "sparkling vampire" and you the the, the music swells as you, as you close the book violently and throw it back into the thing you you, you 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 with a desperate look on your face you move from that entire section of the bookstore to a different section of the bookstore and you open up a book and it's a graphic novel and you open it up to a random page and there's a sparkling vampire and you snap it <laughs> shut <laughs> did uh... Did you happen to catch the uh, the part of the good guy where I was poking fun at the sparkling vampires? I I vaguely remember that. Yes, <laughs> where where is Gelda bites Avos and she's she gets all that sunlight power. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I I've never read Twilight or watched any of the movies, but just the idea of the sparkling vampire was enough to turn me off from ever caring well, it's, about it's that. A, it's a, we we we've we've described 
what Twilight is previously making the same argument about like Smallville. It's teen drama bullshit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it it, it is, <laughs> and, and 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 that's okay because there's an audience for it, and you know, it you don't need to you don't need to love every book that's out there. No, um, you you really don't. And like I said, more power to you if you can make money doing it. It's just you know, I, I wish there was more of the other stuff too. But I guess that well, makes I the mean, other I mean, stuff more special. Yeah, well, well, it's not just that. I mean, there, there's multiple types of people that read books, and that's fine, too. That, that means that there's a market for people that write different things as well. So, you know, there's even a market for people that write things that are, like, nonsensical gibberish. So, yeah, you can even try that, and, you know, it's it's more of a it's more of a dice roll, but, you know, go for it if you hey, want. Hey, don't knock my target audience. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking more of that book that... Uh, that they made me read in the, my first year of university. Oh, I can't remember the title of it, but it was the it, it was it was um it was that it was that insufferable uh like political feminist book that they made me read and I can't remember what it was called, but it was the the one book that I've ever considered burning. I didn't burn it, but I considered it. And uh it's probably still in a box somewhere in in one of my closets. I, I remember reading a lot of really bad fiction in yeah. college. We had to we had to read Lolita for one of my college courses. Okay. I was like, what? can we just watch anime instead? I'll get the picture, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it was so horrible. <laughs> that book is a nightmare to read. It's just like, why are there three pages of this guy cleaning out his ears? Oh god, really? Yikes. It's just like, I, I get it. This guy wants to bang a child, and the child wants to stare at a woman naked. I just, that's, there's, I mean, I know there's more to it on a deeper level in the book, but it's not anything that I find particularly profound or useful in any part of my life whatsoever, other than I think a lot of people in Hollywood used it as a guidebook at some point. Uh, fair enough. But anyway, those are, with some digressions, those are our thoughts on uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Final thoughts? Read the book. Read the book, enjoy the book, or don't if it's not your cup of tea, but try, yeah, try to... Yeah, it, it, it doesn't need to be your cup of tea, but even if it's not your cup of tea, there are things to learn from it if you're trying to write. And because of the way it's written in various letter formats and diary yes. formats, you can... It's a book you could probably just pick up and like read one entry every once in a while if you're bored, and even if you yeah. don't like the book that much, you can still get through it that way. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great... I think I mentioned this before, but it's a great way to get a feel for including different character voices in the same story. So, th 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 that, that at a bare minimum is a good reason to take a look at it. Kind of get a feel for how Jack... how uh, Seward's writing is different from Harker's writing, is different from Mina's writing. And, uh, yeah. It, it's It's a... It's 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 worth looking at for that for that purpose alone, but it's also a good book in its own right. Do yourself a favor and read the book. Yeah, and then write some fun vampire fiction in which the vampires are actually cool. We could use more of that. We could use more of that. I I will say that it, I got on a vampire kick, a like very late in life. I didn't care uh -huh. too much about vampires before around. I think it was around. A little bit before 2010, like like around the time Higarashi came out, uh huh, and that was probably what launched me into actually getting interested in more horror and monster stuff. Because up until then, I was largely just interested in fantasy and science fiction. Yeah, and yeah. Higarashi hit, and it's like, oh, this stuff can actually be really good. So I started looking for other stuff, and then of course Umineko came out, and. And then I was watching zombie movies, which I thought a lot of them were cool, even if some of them were bad. And then I sure. I slowly got into the vampire movies, and I was like, oh, some of these are actually pretty good, too. And they do interesting and different things with the vampires. And and then, you know, over the course of a couple of years, I got more and more interested up until the point where I was just like, I'm going to write something with vampires. Yeah, yeah. All right. I guess that is our episode for t t for today, for this week. Once again, we're the Wordy Pair. I'm Rudy. And I'm Justin. And uh, we will see you next time. Thanks for listening.
Thanks for listening to the Wordy Pair Podcast. Our passion is all things writing, world building, and getting into the weird and wonderful world of fiction. We hope you enjoyed our unique takes. If you did, make sure to like, rate, review, and subscribe to get your weekly dose of writing weirdness. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit us up on Twitter. For Rudy, it's at Rudolph underscore Cone. And for Justin, at Ninja Mouse Chew. See you next time on the Wordy Pear Podcast.